Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our Oregon PERS webinar. We're going to wait about another minute or so here to let other people um, come into the Zoom or Facebook, wherever you're watching us from. But either way, welcome. We're excited to be here with you today. How are you doing, Jason? I am well. Lovely. A lovely Wednesday in the big city. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Love it. Pretty excited about today. I love talking about Oregon PERS. We're going to go over some pretty cool stuff. I hope our uh, audience is excited. <laughs> oh, yes. There's always new twists and turns with, with PERS, aren't there? Uh, yeah. So let's just uh, twist and turn and get started, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Awesome. All righty. So um, thank you all for joining us today. So the first question I kind of want to put out there is you. Who is Financial Freedom Wealth Management Group. So we were founded in the year 2000 by our current CEO, Julia Carlson. And we are a comprehensive wealth management firm um, that is committed to helping our clients improve their long-term success and pursue their version of financial freedom. So a couple of the people that we serve are retirees, business owners, or people just going through transitions in their life, but we really try to help as many people as possible on top of just those three categories. And when you're a client of financial freedom, we want you all to know that our commitment is to care deeply about you and your financial life. And that is how we um, conduct ourselves when we do our financial planning. So that's just a little bit of who we are. We have a wonderful growing team. So pictured here, is actually just a handful of us. <laughs> we have some other members that are not pictured, but we are working on getting them added soon. But we collectively are seven wealth advisors and 13 support staff that are here to support uh, the needs of our clients. Um, but also we love hanging out and working together. So it's a really high performing team. So uh, this is just a snapshot of who we are. And today I have the privilege of being here with Jason Harris. He is our vice president and chief operating officer for the company. Uh, Jason is a certified financial planner professional, most commonly known as a CFP. Um, fun fact, Jason and I are both Oregon State University graduates, so go Beavs. We're loving this football season thus far. Uh, but Jason also has his MBA in finance from Waldron University. Uh, Jason also has a really active role in his community um, at the Chamber of Commerce and other uh, committees as well. Um, and when Jason's not in the office, he loves spending time with his family and his kids. And I also hear you're like biking. Biking is a fun activity that you like to do. So I I applaud you for that. That's really fun. Thanks, Edgar. Yes, from time <laughs> to time, uh, <laughs> after my uh, recent mishap, you know, it's a little bit less. So, <laughs> but yes, thanks so much, Edgar. Um, Edgar is one of our wealth advisors. He's uh, been with the company for, oh, goodness, are we on over four years now, over right? Four, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, glad to have him as the, key part of our team. And um, one thing I do want to acknowledge, because I know we still have some Duck fans on our team <laughs> and probably on this <laughs> webinar. So we're not anti-Ducks, okay? No. So so we, we do support all the teams. Uh, otherwise, we get in big trouble with some of our other <laughs> team members. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Edgar did graduate uh, Bachelor of Science uh, with honors, actually. Uh, and focused in finance and economics. Um, so I know in your spare time, your most important thing you like doing is, is the disc golf. That's, yes, that's yes. key, but then also watching and playing soccer and other sports and, mm -hmm. and uh, just getting in the great outdoors. Yeah. So glad to have you here, Edgar. Thanks. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So we're gonna start today with just a general overview of PERS, Oregon PERS. So as you can see on your screen, there are three different categories that you can fall into and it all depends on when you were hired. So you can see the criteria needed on the screen. One really neat thing about Oregon PERS is that 
all three of these categories are paid for by the public employer. So your pension through the Oregon State PERS system is paid by your employer, which is really unusual. No employee contributions go in, but there are other components of PERS that you need to be aware about. And one of the most common ones is the uh, IAP, also known as Individual Account Program. This is a different pot of money, if you will, where you actually can put your money into it. Uh, it takes about 6% of your salary um, that the employee can contribute, but sometimes your employer can even help pick some of this up uh, instead of pay. So there are many ways to go about it, and we're going to break things down as we move forward today. But these are the three main categories, Tier 1, Tier 2, and OPSERP. So for I want to focus on Tier 1 and Tier 2. So what you can see on the screen in front of you right now is what it takes to retire with full retirement benefits or reduced retirement benefits. So all members of Tier 1 and Tier 2 can retire at any age with full benefits as long as they have been with PERS for 30 years. Um, but if you're tier one or tier two, I kind of want to do a case study here to kind of um, put an example of the, out there of how this works. So let's assume you have someone who is age 56 and they have less than 30 years of PERS experience. Are they able to retire if they are tier one with full benefits? The answer is no. In order to retire from tier one with full benefits, you need to be age 58, plain and simple. If you're age 58, you'll be fine. Or you're any age but have 30 years of service. This same individual, 56 years old, less than 30 years of per service, is also not eligible to retire with full benefits from tier two. As you can see on the screen, you need to be age 60 to retire from tier two. It doesn't matter how much PERS you have, or again, any age with at least 30 years of service. But what if you are 56 and have more than 30 years, 30 plus years of service, then you do qualify for retirement because you have that 30 years under your belt for full benefits. Um, police and fire have different eligibility rules, and you can see those kind of on the screen here as well. But for day, today's purposes, we're going to focus just on general service members. Um, and I also want to point out, if you have questions, go ahead and put them into the Q&A or the chat box, and we will answer them as quickly as we can. And we will have an opportunity at the end to answer questions as well. So now I want to focus on OPSERP. So this one's a little bit different. And what I want to point out is once you are age 65, if you're a general or service member, you can retire with full benefits. It does not matter how many years of PERS you have. Your benefit may be affected, but the just simple categorization of you being able to retire with full retirement benefits, age 65 is you're good to go. But if you don't want to wait until 65, you can retire with full benefits from OPSER at age 58, as long as you have 30 years of service. But if you want to retire a little bit earlier, uh, what happens there if you're OPSER? You can retire as early as age 55, but you have to make sure that you are fully vested in OPSERP to get some of those reduced benefits. And to be vested in OPSERP, you need to have worked six, at least 600 hours in five individual calendar years. And you cannot have a gap of employment with PERS of more than five years as you start to accrue that. Um, so it's very common for people to think that they have to work for, for five years straight and get those 600 hours, and that's actually not correct. You can have some gaps in your employment as long as those gaps are not larger than five years. Um, and as you can see on the screen, police and fire 911 operators have different um, eligibility requirements as well. And we are happy to discuss that in a one-on-one -on -one appointment if it applies to you. Jason. Great. Well, thank you, Edgar, for, for setting that up. That's a good template to go off of, kind of gives you the basic overview of the different pension programs. 
OPSERP, also you might hear uh, as a tier three, it's technically not tier three, but that's, that's what a lot of people call it. So I just think about that again, based off of your higher date. So let's talk a little bit about these tier one and tier two pensions. How do they actually work? Because it is a little complicated, even on the slide, it's a little complicated, but we wanted to lay it all out for you as, as clear and orderly as we could. Uh, but as you can see, they do this calculation for how much you're going to get on a, for a monthly pension based off of your age, your average uh, salary, uh, time of service, and then the account balance that you see building on your statement, which we'll also talk through that as well. But there's a very simple yet complex calculation. <laughs> there's actually two different ones that can be used. It's either the full formula or the money match. Uh, and you can see there's two different ways that they calculate that. Very, you know, behind the scenes, they're gonna crunch the numbers for you. It's not quite a black box, but uh, they'll give you those numbers and you will get the higher of either of those. So if, if one spits out a bigger number, you get the bigger amount, which is why a lot of people like the tier one and tier two uh, be, for those reasons. Of course, you're not eligible if you're hired uh, too, too late, according to this. Yeah. Okay, so here, uh, here's an example of an estimate for how to figure out your full formula. We won't do the money match, just full formula as an example. Let's say your final average salary was 45,000, 46, and 48 for the year. That's 38.61 monthly over that time. Times that by your 30 years of service, assuming you did that, mu that much, and then that special factor of 0.167 or one and two thirds percent <laughs> gets you to the magical number of $1,934 per month as an estimate of your benefit. We'll talk to you about how to get a, a more specific number, but that'll just give you a ballpark of, okay, I'm going to get about 2000 a month uh, from my retirement based off of this detail. So let's talk a little bit about observe. So we have this big cross out on the left side. <laughs> that is for tier one and tier two. So not to complicate anything, but if we cross that out, your OPSERT pension is much simpler. So it really just takes those employer contributions that Edgar was talking about earlier, uh, which goes into a fund, and then that's how your pension is determined. And on the other side of that blue line, that's IAP, which we'll talk about in more detail here in a moment. But let's run through a scenario of OPSERP and explain that here on the next slide. There's slightly different factors here. It's really just your creditable service time and then your final average salary. Now, it's taking the average of the highest three consecutive years, okay? So if you had some higher years earlier, maybe you went part-time or something like that, if you had higher years earlier, it's gonna take those higher ones or it's your final 36 months, which is three years, okay? So to calculate this pension, there's just one option, which is kind of nice, right? You don't have to play, okay, is it gonna be, you know, which one? This is just service time times your final average salary times one and a half percent or 0 0.015 if you're doing it on the traditional calculator. So let's run through, it's the same exact final uh, average salary number. So assuming these are your highest, uh, 45, 46, and 48 divided by 36, same number, times that by 30 years, same years of service, but this time it's times 0.015%. And now, as you can see, the benefit's actually a little bit lower because we're going off a little bit lower uh, percentage number. So about 1737 per month as your benefit under OPSERP. So still a good pension. Uh, it, it's just calculate a little bit differently. Okay, now we're to the wonderful IAP account. So almost if you, you have to really separate it and we'll, we'll show you even on your statement how it is separated. Your pension is one bucket of money and then your IAP is a different bucket of money. You can almost think of the IAP more as 
like a 401k, right? So you, this is the one, like Edgar was saying, you have an opportunity to, well, not opportunity, a requirement to put some money into it. <laughs> um, and really this money is yours. So it's not tied to the pension. It's not gonna be used to calculate your benefits. Mm -hmm. This will be an account that you will either utilize or take with you if you, uh, once you are in retirement. So our wonderful arrow here that shows your IEP kind of splitting up, <laughs> that is because in July of 2020, so two years ago, um, before all of that 6% was going directly to your IEP account. And so now what's happened is if you earn more than 2,500 in a given month, a portion of your IEP will go to help stabilize your pension, which is what EPSA is. It's the Employee Pension Stability Account is what that stands for. So if you're tier one or tier two, it's two and a half percent of that. Uh, so two and a half percent of what would, you know, you normally would have gotten 6%. Now two and a half is going over, over there on those given months. And for, it says tier three, but it's really the, the OPSER, 0.75% is veering off into the special stability account for you. So as you can see, this uh, affects the tier one and tier two a little bit more, and that's because the pension benefit is a little bit better. Um, so they're trying to stabilize it as, as we're going forward. So that was a bill placed in the law, and we just have to do it. So... Um, Great, how do you get your money out of IAP? Well, there are really three main ways. You can do a lump sum distribution where the check just gets sent straight to you. It's all taxable. Be careful because taxes, that if it bumps you in a new tax bracket, now you're paying extra tax on that. But it certainly is an option. Uh, and depending on the size of it, you, you know, you'll wanna talk with a financial professional to, to uh, assess that for you. Your other option is a lump sum rollover. So just like in a 401k, think about it. You can move it, roll it over into an IRA that you're managing um, or to someone else that's managing it for you. The third way is that you can do it in installments over your lifetime, or you can say, hey, over the next five years, send me a check and I'll pay the taxes on it. So you have different options, 5, 10, 15, 20, or your lifetime and different ways you can collect those funds and the investments will keep in what you have inside IAP um, until you take it out. So you do need to be careful though here because once you do make that selection in your retirement paperwork, it is locked in. Uh, now you could just take the whole thing out or do a rollover at some point, but if you're doing distributions or anything or, or taking the whole thing, that, that's your decision at that point. Yeah. And it's important to point out that when you retire from PERS, you as the member are required to choose one of these distribution options. That's you right. can't just leave. So so that's just something to keep in mind as, as you decide if you're going to retire or not. Yeah. Good reminder. Okay. Now, IEP has changed their investments over the past couple of years now. Uh, you now have these target date fund options and you will be defaulted based off of your birth year. So let's just say if you're 65, uh, excuse me, born in 1965, uh, you would have the target date fund, if we look across from 63 to 67, target date of 2030. So what that means is that you are projected to retire around the year 2030. So your uh, investments inside that target date fund are going to be geared towards utilizing that money in the year 2030. So in this case, since we are only eight years away from 2030, you're going to see that your investments are a lot more conservative. You'll have less stocks in the account, more bonds, more cash, um, and, and that's the way that will run. But each September, which, which month are we in right now? It's September. <laughs> you have the ability to change your investments for the next year. So for 2023, you can go in and change your IEP investments in the month of September only to affect next year. 
Okay. So let's say you wanted to say, okay, well, I'm, I was born in 65, but I'd like to be a little bit more aggressive with my investments because I'm not going to use all of this. I've got other accounts and things that I'll use first. You can say, hey, I want to do a 2035, or you can even do a 2060 fund if you want to be very aggressive with it. Or it can be the opposite. Well, goodness, I'm, I may need to use this money sooner. Let me put it down to 2025 or 2020. Uh, if you want to keep those investments conservative. Um, and our team also can help you if you're kind of looking at, okay, what should I be doing? The market's kind of crazy. I don't know. Everything's down, down, down. Um, we can help you assess your situation, looking at all that you're doing to make sure you're on the right track for that. Okay, Edgar, how do we read these statements? Yes. So we just received a lot of really good information and we are in the season of updating your IAP. So let's go over your member annual statement just to point out what's going on when you get this. When you get this form, most if not all of this information is really important. It's important to just take a look at everything, make sure your date of birth in the top right corner is correct, your hire date, all these little things, please make sure that they are accurate. But I do want to point out some key areas to review. And the first one is your tier balance. So if you look kind of at the middle of the screen, lower middle half of the screen, there's a green box that says your 2021 tier balance. And we're using 2021 just as an example today. You can see how much money is in that pot for your pension calculation. Um, and then on the bottom left hand side of this form, you can see your years of service, which is important, especially if you're considering retiring early and want to know how many years you have so that you can calculate whether you're vested or not. So you can see that on the bottom left hand side. Um, so your tier balance and your years of service are two key components that you should review every year. And then on the next page, you will have your IAP information. So the first box here with the little red uh, dot next to it, that is the IAP target date fund that you are invested in. So for this example, this person is in the 2030 fund. So now you know where to figure out what you're invested in. And now you can use this information to decide if you want to be more aggressive, more conservative, or just let it be. Uh, the other thing that's worth noting here is at the bottom, uh, hopefully you can see my cursive here of the 2021 IAP information, you can see your decisions for next year if you have um, something already in the works. And just above that, you can see your balance. So a lot of information is provided on these forms, and it's always good to just do a quick little check-in on them when you receive them, just to make sure everything's going okay. Um, and at the bottom of this page here, you can also see how much, if any of your money has gone into that EPSA account that Jason mentioned earlier. So all of the options except for the total lump sum guarantees the PERS member a lifetime income. But when you're deciding higher, one question that you should ask yourself is if something happens to you, how do you want to provide for your beneficiaries? So in the next few slides, we're going to go over the different options you have as a retirement benefit for the different uh, categories. Yes, this, and this is where it can also kind of have your head spinning a little bit, because look at all these different options. There are <laughs> quite a few so um but it is all about like edgar's saying is your beneficiaries who you're leaving behind you know how do you want that to work mm -hmm. so the very simplest is the option one and i promise i'm not going to go through all these because we'll mm -hmm. we'll all uh be brain dead afterwards so we won't <laughs> do that um uh, option one is the highest and best payout but you have nothing left for beneficiaries so if you are wanting to leave something to someone uh, then you'll you'll want to choose a different option. And with each of these, you'll also, when you run the actual estimate, which you can do online, um, you can ask for up to two per year as an official estimate, mm -hmm. um, as long as you're within two years of your retirement date. Um, you can get an official one. You can also go online to uh, the PERS website 
and do some example ones that you can walk through that are not as accurate, but at least give you an, a, a rough sketch of what these different options will pay out for you. So when we're always calculating the, the pension like we did earlier, it's always off of option one. Your benefit gets reduced if you choose any of these other options, but they may actually be right for you even though the money's less specific to you. For example, option two, if, you, if your beneficiary, let's say your spouse uh, outlives you, your beneficiary would get exactly what you're getting. So whatever that number is, even though it's a little less, they'll get what, what you're getting. Mm -hmm. So bunch of different things here. You can do option one plus get a lump sum. Uh, you can take the whole amount out. So that, that lump sum option that you saw on there, um, they basically double that number with the employer matching piece. Uh, so you definitely have many options to explore. <laughs> Yes, and we can help go through that decision making. There are many factors that you should consider when deciding what to do with your tier one or tier two option. And our team is fully equipped to help answer some of those questions. So that's right. Yes. Yeah, the other piece you may see on there is a purchase option. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities that some people will have to essentially buy back or, or get a higher pension uh, by putting a little bit of money into the program. So mm -hmm. Just be aware of that as you're sorting through. But yes, we are readily available to help you with perks. Yes. Okay, then OPSERP, tier three, the other one. Uh, in a weird way, I like this one much better because it's super <laughs> simple. You only have five, five options and you don't have a lump sum option, which uh, that, that can be disheartening, but you still have your IEP. Everyone gets the IEP. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes if the lump sum is basically, they could pay you out this whole plan if it's too, if your pension would have been too low. But the nice thing is you get to select right here. Do you want single life, survivorship, or where your beneficiary gets half? Super simple. So mm -hmm. Edgar, where do we go from here? We have so much information. And I know <laughs> if any of you guys have questions that you want us to to uh, talk through right now, feel free to put those in the Q&A, but what should we do at this point? So yes, that was a lot of wonderful information. And if you are watching this and you're thinking, man, I could really use some help with deciding what I want to do with my PERS, or even if you're a client of ours, you know, we're offering complimentary consultations. All you have to do to get the process started is text, text PERS to 458-777-4458. Once we get that text, we'll go ahead and contact you to get that appointment scheduled, um, and we're happy to, to, to meet anyone and help with your PERS questions. Um, a little bit about LPL Financial. So they are our broker dealer and happen to be the largest independent broker dealer in the country. Um, so we are glad to be partnered with them and help our clients you know, pursue their financial goals in conjunction with LPL. Everybody loves disclosures. <laughs> so I'll leave these up just for a few seconds so everybody could speed read them. Um, very exciting, I know. Um, but at this moment in time, I would like to open up the floor or the box for questions. And I'll just leave things here on the screen in case someone wants to go ahead and draw down the number and the instructions for how to contact us. So um, we're ready for your questions. Well, Edgar, we may have cut. Oh, we do have one. <laughs> All right. Can you clarify a bit more on the EPSA? Are the funds usable for the PERS employee or are they, or are they just gone once retired? Great question. Uh, the EPSA account, uh, it, they do say that you get that money back into your pension somehow. But if you think about it, the pension is all paid by the employer. So um, it, it really is meant to stabilize the pension so they can pay these pensions out. So the short answer is uh, no, you will not 
receive those funds directly, it'll still be tied into your pension. Um, yeah, so it is, it is no longer yours once it goes in there. Mm-hmm. So, but they still call it out. I think it's probably for transparency. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, then we have another one. Okay. Uh, I might have missed this. I also have social security. Do we do both at the same time? Also, how does unsick, unused sick time value in? So for the social security part, I would say we should schedule a complimentary consultation because there's a lot of different factors we have to consider before you turn your social security income on. And one of the biggest things that we have to identify is you may retire from PERS, but does that mean you're going to stop working? Some people choose to go to a private employer or something of the sorts, which would impact whether or not Social Security will be a really good option for you. Also, your age comes into consideration as well, um, because you can take Social Security early at a reduced benefit. So. The, the, the quick answer is we should schedule an appointment to discuss your situation in detail to determine what the appropriate actions are for you and your family. Mm-hmm. And unused sick leave, I'm not sure if that goes into the pension calculation. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but we'd be glad to, to meet with you and, yeah. and dive into that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I don't believe it calculates in because they generally will pay that out. Your employer will pay that out. So my my first inclination is a no on that. Right. Um, and yeah, again, with, with Edgar's piece, you can retire early in, in PERS, but Social Security, you may not be able to, to c- claim that without other ramifications tax-wise and from Social Security itself. So be careful. Correct. There. Yes. Okay, we have another one. Mm-hmm. For someone who worked in tier two PERS position for three and a half years back in the early 2000s, what does it take to get vested? <laughs> so the first thing is, is, is age, um, but then also we have to, I can go back if you wish to give you a more grand view of everything for tier one, tier two. So if you were tier two, you can retire early between the age of 55 and 60 if you have less than 30 years of PERS um, work. So that seems like where you will qualify. But if you are 58, if you wait until age 58, you can retire with full benefits. But again, the calculation of your pension is going to depend on those average salaries and the other factors. So depending on your age, it may be good to request an official statement if you qualify for reduced retirement or even full retirement. But um, there's a handful of variables at play here. Um, And we'd be happy to go over those in more detail with you at an appointment um, just to kind of see where things stand for you at this time. Great question. Great. Okay. Looks like we have answered all the questions in the queue. Thank you so much for your time and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. Be well, everyone. Take care.